and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to this webinar on nature-based solutions, how to implement them, when to not implement them, and what they mean and, and how we're going to take them forward. So my name's Elliot Whittington. I am Chief System Change Officer at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. We are uh, an institution as part of the University of Cambridge, but we work with leaders from business, government and finance to accelerate and support uh, the transition towards a more sustainable economy. We, we've done a number of bits of work with our, our stakeholders, with our different audiences on this, this uh, issue of um, addressing the impacts on nature and working to secure some of the opportunities that can come with working with nature to create a better ways of doing things. So what I think is often called nature-based solutions. Um, for those of you who are interested in any of that work and want to refer to it either during this call, but hopefully afterwards, because we've got some, some really interesting discussion and dialogue going on, you can check out our website and we have a, a nature positive hub, which includes our recent piece of work with decision making in a nature positive world, which talks about some of the practicalities of introducing nature based solutions. Um, we're obviously working uh, and, and doing this work in the context of a dramatic and, and challenging world, you know, with new stories about, um, you know, biodiversity loss and the impacts on nature, how we're damaging um, kind of vital natural ecosystems like our, our fresh water, like our oceans, like our soils, um, and particular particular ecosystems, our, our woodlands, our wildlife, our pipe peatlands, uh, unfortunately fill, fill our news media more and more. At the same time, we're sort of seeing the worsening impacts of climate change and challenging polarization and inequality rising around social uh, conversation. But there are there is this opportunity that can very much come. Working with nature, we can unlock things that can uh, deliver not just restoration and, and uh, expansion of a degraded natural environment, but also economic benefits, social benefits, health benefits, benefits in the fight against climate change. And that's where, where nature-based solutions is, uh, often comes in. Um, at CRSL, we, we've worked with a number of stakeholders who have engaged in this, supported this, and we wanted to hold this webinar to take this conversation to the next level. It feels like there's quite a lot of conversation that's going on right now about nature-based solutions, about what they are and what they mean, but less so about how to do them, when to do them, when not to do them, what what some of the practicalities are in terms of implementing them. And that's, that's what we're hoping to um, explore in this conversation. We're also very much looking to, um, you know, one of the kind of strengths of CISL is I think we, we like to look at things from the point of view of how different actors and different um, organisations can come together about these kind of things and how we can explore where, where the potential to ladder up individual solutions into change at scale, into systemic change that can transform different approaches. So I am very pleased that we are uh, joined by a uh, informed and expert uh, set of panelists. Um, and I think it will be a, a hugely wonderful um, and inf informative conversation. So we have Owen Bethel, who is the Environmental Impact Lead for uh, Nestle, um, works on climate, biodiversity and water issues within the global public affairs team at Nestle, and is very much kind of an expert on, on uh, some of the implications around these questions. We have Melissa Miner, Miners, sorry, who spent a decade at Unilever, also in a similar kind of role, working on the, the public policy and advocacy issues around uh, biodiversity, nature, climate, and, and many other things. I was often uh, told in that role not to use the phrase nature-based solutions, but worked on some of the same ways that we're talking about in terms of engaging in, in how nature can unlock positive changes. She's also a trustee at the National Park Cities Organization. Um, so with you know, huge relevance there, because I think a lot of the things we talk about come back to uh, how, uh, you know, nature can be shifted and nature is very much about particular places and particular locations. And finally, we have Craig Bennett, CEO of the Wildlife Trusts um, and, uh, you know, a uh, director and associate in many uh, organisations, including CISL. Um, so, uh, uh, indeed, a former colleague in that sense, but uh, a long-standing expert um, in environmental issues, a campaigner, advocate and um, movement builder around uh, biodiversity protection, climate issues and many other things. So hopefully um, you'll agree this is going to be a really interesting conversation. For those of you who have questions, so we are currently broadcasting on GoToWebinar, but we're also being streamed on LinkedIn and YouTube. 
if you have questions if you want to put them in the comments section of either linkedin or youtube um, we've got people kind of watching those and we will make hoover up all the best questions and we'll try we'll start with a bit of conversation with our panelists um, and then move on to uh, a session where we're able to take questions and we'll we'll see how many questions we can get through we've already had some so it looks like um, there's a lot of interest um, and we'll we'll move through that and, and uh, try and deal with any questions we're getting from the audience um, but other than that we hope you uh, stick with us for what promises to be an interesting and engaging hour of discussion and dialogue now without too much further ado you've heard a lot from me i'm gonna i'm gonna hand over to our panelists and get them to give us their thoughts on this topic on this challenge and how they what they see as some of the kind of key issues and key questions are and in fact oh and if i start with you um and just over to you from, from your perspective particularly from from the nestle world Sure, thank you, uh, Elliot, and thanks very much to CISL for the opportunity to speak today uh, at this event. I think um, forests have been something that have been high on the agenda for Nestle for a long time. Um, it's not just a, a recent uh, discovery, if you like, um, in terms of the impact that our company has through our supply chains. It's been a, a decades long uh, journey of discovery around um, understanding that impact, addressing that impact, and, and now looking to the future seeing what positive um, effect we can have through our climate journey to net zero and um, the actions we're taking on nature. So I think it really kind of kicked off around 2009, 2010, when uh, we started to gain a lot more visibility on the supply chains that we rely on, particularly around palm oil, where um, you know there have been long running concerns around uh, forest loss. And um, the company took the approach of focusing on ending the risk of deforestation in key at-risk commodity chains to begin with um, and that included palm oil and um, four others which were based on the on, on the materiality assessment of where our key risks were um, the way that we've addressed that risk is through improving traceability understanding you know where are the ingredients that we source coming from um, and how do we ensure that they're not coming from areas which are at risk um, we've also introduced things like uh, satellite monitoring and on the ground verification, working with partners um, to make sure that the, the traceability data is actually backed up by real world um, experience and um, the use of technology as well. And uh, very pleased to say that by the end of 2022, we'd reached around 99% uh, verified deforestation free for those five main commodities um, and are working hard towards um, reaching that number for coffee and cocoa as well, which will be uh, achieved by the end of 2025. So um, by that point, uh, I think we'll have done a good job on addressing most of the do no harm element of, of nature-based solutions. So first of all, we've got to stop the harm happening, um, at, particularly in at-risk areas, um, before then kind of really ramping up our efforts on reforestation, uh, and well, first, first deforest conservation, um, beyond no deforestation, and then restoration and regeneration as well. Um, the way we're looking at that is, unsurprisingly very connected to the climate journey but i think not just limited to that and i think that that's one topic to explore on today's webinar is is moving moving beyond just a sort of carbon mindset when it comes to uh forest uh planting and growing um and also thinking about how we monitor these things over the long term uh, and ensure the correct species are planted in the right places that communities are involved very closely in those efforts and that we ensure um carbon sequestration over the long term and address some concerns that have been legitimately raised around that um, by various stakeholders um, more recently. So we have an objective now of um, planting the equivalent of 200 million trees by 2030. That's the carbon removals element of our net zero plan for this decade. Um, and and that, that is happening within the value chains where we source from. So um, again, there's kind of an opportunity for co-benefits there where we link uh, forest positive project that we're investing into a sourcing region where we may be transitioning to more regenerative forms of agriculture as well um, and quite often the things are actually directly combined you know through an agroforestry system or through improving the the biodiversity of field strips and other uh, adjacent areas to where we're actually buying our ingredients from so i think there's great opportunity there for um bringing it all together on a, on a landscape basis um we've got examples in in cocoa coffee uh some other commodities as well um and sourcing uh 
our ingredients in a way which actually creates a, a positive impact on, on nature, a, a more of a restorative effect on nature. Um, you know, bearing in mind that it's, it's not about restoring ecosystems to their pristine state, but it's about reducing the negative impacts of, of agricultural landscape management and starting to put something back in terms of our, our business impact. So uh, happy to explore a few examples today uh, on the webinar and um, looking forward to, this, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. And over to Melissa to give us your perspective. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, everything Rowan said resonates a lot with me because um, in, in some supply chains, Unilever and uh, Nestle are in very similar positions. I, I, I should say um, at the start, just to um, reiterate your introduction, I have now left Unilever. I've, I've chosen to leave and do some consulting to spend some time, more time with my kids while they're very little, but I have spent the last 10 years there, so I, I, I can reference examples. And, and the, the um, I think you mentioned before, um, I, I often don't like the term uh, nature-based solutions because it comes with so much controversy. Like it, 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 it makes sense as a phrase, but um, in, in certain countries in which we operate, um, it, it can be very contentious. You know, that there's always that phrase that I love, our nature is not your solution. And um, it, it doesn't mean that companies aren't committed to um, kind of um, investment in nature and uh, nature positive supply chains but it's it's often a tricky term um and 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 that's a wider point on how you deploy some of this at a, a huge scale when you're operating in 190 plus countries um what what, what does you, do your operations on nature and what does your measurement na on nature look like in in very different areas um and I really liked what Owen said. Um, I was going to say something uh, similar, but he said it in a much better way about moving beyond the carbon mindset, because um, again, that's kind of one of the controversies with nature-based solutions is it's the assumption that you're going to buy carbon credits. But I think we're talking about the wider UN definition of nature-based solutions, which is an investment in, in nature. I've got the definition in front of me, but I won't read it out. Um, so I'm, I'm very encouraged by um, the global biodiversity framework. Um, not, not, not. I mean, moving beyond the actual words that are in the policy, but the whole movement that's happening around the global biodiversity framework in, in terms of investor interest, company action, uh, grassroots movement. I, I feel like in, in terms of kind of people talked about trying to create the Paris moment for nature around um, the coming Montreal Declaration. And for me, that 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 feels very live at the moment. Um, having looked at this stuff for the last 10 years, I'm, I'm feeling very excited about the momentum and the campaign uh, behind that. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And it's a it's a really important kind of call out you make. So for those of you in our audience who don't know, um, as part of the kind of UN process around biodiversity, there was a meeting in, in Montreal, host, co-hosted by the Chinese government, which agreed a new global framework for biodiversity at, the, at what was the COP15 of, of that framework, the, the 15th conference of that framework. Um, uh, CISR had a presence there along with, with many of the other organizations involved, but it was a, a really important breakthrough moment for the world. Craig, maybe if I could hand over to you to give us your perspectives on this conversation. Thank you, Elliot, and great to be joining you all, be joining Owen and Melissa on this uh, very important discussion. A couple of things, first of all, about the Wildlife Trust. We're actually one of the largest nature NGOs uh, here in the UK and actually in the world when you put it together. We're a federation of locally run uh, wildlife trusts across the UK, uh, 46 in total. Uh, but collectively, our scale is, is quite extraordinary. We're actually the, uh, we have almost a million members in the UK. Uh, we are uh, we have more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK. Um, in fact, a thousand more, and we estimate that 60% of the British population live within three miles of one of our reserves. And in total, we are the seventh largest landholder in the UK, and actually have uh, almost 3,000 staff. So that gives you an idea of our kind of scale, working across a huge range of natural habitats and working very closely with people and communities. In doing that as well. Before I was at the Wildlife Trust, uh, I had a long uh, career in working in NGOs, including internationally. I was at Frenzy Earth and on the board of Frenzy Earth International for many years, and I've worked uh, closely with business as well, not least at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and uh, worked with business on many, many initiatives. And I say all that not just to give you my biography, but to say that you know I I do kind of look at these issues from all of those perspectives, from a business perspective, from an NGO perspective, from a community perspective, 
And also I've had periods of my career when I focused on nature and periods of my career when I focused on climate, if you like. One of the things that's driven me mad over many decades is just how for too long in the sustainability community, we've treated the climate crisis and the nature crisis as if they're quite separate things. And it's a, often a different group of people that work on them. Uh, we have different UN conventions working on them. And there might be logic in that focus at times, but even people in the sustainability community often don't realize that these issues are inextricably linked. You know, just to put it really clearly, we have absolutely no hope whatsoever of solving the climate crisis unless we can put nature in recovery. And we have no hope of solving the ecological crisis unless we can tackle climate change. The clue for that should be staring us right in the face. It's really obvious. We often talk about fossil fuels. How often do we stop to think that fossil fuels are actually dead biodiversity? And it's biodiversity that captured carbon millions of years ago, locked it up in what we now call fossil fuels. And when we burn fossil fuels, we're really releasing the carbon that was captured by nature millions of years before. So that's just as a preface on this. And I mean, because of that, I'm incredibly enthusiastic broadly about nature-based solutions. But there are things we do need to be really careful about. And it's really careful that particularly people working in the nature space, and I say this just to people as, just as much as in NGOs as I do in business, that we've got to be careful not to overstate the role that nature-based solutions can play, uh, while also being very enthusiastic about them. The reality is that nature-based solutions have a real but limited role that they can play in tackling, for example, the climate crisis. And I say that because all too often people will hold them up as the answer, the silver bullet. You will probably find hardly anyone more enthusiastic about nature-based solutions than me, but that's all the more reason we've got to be careful about how the role they can play is very real, but it is limited. Now, why is it limited? Well, it's partly because there's a limited amount of space for nature-based solutions. You know, there's only so much area that we can have, sadly, for restoring nature on a fairly crowded world now in many ways. There's also only a limited amount of time. If we're talking about, say, trying to halve global emissions, which is still the plan by 2030, nature can play a big role in that. But all of that has to be in addition to cutting carbon at source, to stop burning fossil fuels. Sometimes it's almost presented as a convenient way out to carry on with business as usual. And that is the way of madness. If we do that, then we will make the whole concept of nature-based solutions toxic in many people's eyes, and rightly so if we did that. So every time we talk about nature-based solutions, we have to talk how it's an addition to stopping the bad stuff happening, stopping burning fossil fuels, stopping uh, allowing pollutants uh, into rivers or whatever. And crucially, this is also important because climate change is the biggest threat to nature now, probably for the rest of this century. You know, uh, extraordinarily, you know, if we're not, if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, climate change becomes a threat to nature-based solutions. So at the precise moment that we need nature at its best state possible to help us out of the climate crisis, if we're not careful, we're reducing the ability for nature to do that. And this is really important, particularly in the offsets debate. You know, I'm, I'm very skeptical about offsets, very cautious about them. I don't rule them out entirely, but actually we say in the NGO community, all of us have to be very careful to make sure that none of this just allows business to carry on with business as usual. You know, we need to see transformational change in the way business goes around business over the next decade or so. Uh, and we need to see that in addition to investing in nature-based solutions, not uh, in nature-based solutions as an alternative to that deep system change that we need. Having said all that, we should celebrate the very real role that nature-based solutions can play. On the climate debate alone, uh, Natalie Seddon, Professor Natalie Seddon at the University of Oxford, if I can dare to mention that other place at the University of Cambridge seminar, um, she and her team have estimated that if we really put effort into it, nature-based solutions could help for around 0.3 degrees of climate mitigation. Well, I take that, you know, we need everything at the moment. And, and actually, uh, given that we're around 1.1 degree and we want to try and keep global temperatures to less than 1.5 degrees, 0.3 degrees is not something to be sniffed at, but it's not going to be really more than that. So we need to be going hard on, on stopping burning fossil fuels as well as uh, nature-based solutions. Secondly, we need to recognise that although we often talk about net zero, Actually, you know what? Net zero is not the destination. We often forget that. It's a very, very important milestone.
But really where we need to get to, certainly by the second half of this century, is net negative. We need to be taking carbon out the air. And much as some people love to talk about these machines as yet uninvented to take carbon out the air for us, we have trillions of machines that do that brilliantly for us for free. They're called trees and they're called wetlands and they're called uh, blue carbon in the, in the oceans as well. Even fish, even biodiversity, even the abundance of species is brilliant at locking up carbon in the biosphere as opposed to the atmosphere as well. So actually let's focus on restoring the abundance of nature and getting nature working again to really suck carbon out of the air. So we absolutely there's a role of nature-based solutions in climate mitigation, but we shouldn't overstate it. However, there's also a phenomenally brilliant role that nature-based solutions can play in climate adaptation. And there, we almost can't possibly overstate how effective they can be because nature-based solutions actually can provide the buffer zones. They can provide uh, support for flood alleviation. They can hold water back in the landscape. They can call our urban centers. Uh, they can uh, absolutely call our rivers and also clean up our rivers as well. Uh, and this isn't just about planting trees, by the way, much as that's important. Uh, sometimes we don't see the wood for the trees or more to the point the wooden habitat and just how important if you go beyond trees actually the carbon that can be stored in the soil not least through fungal networks in forests if we really create whole forest habitats as well and it's not just about forests it's about those wetlands it's about uh, the abundance of nature it's about blue carbon it's about sea grasses salt marshes and so on a huge range of nature-based solutions can do it you know if we really think about it, I defy anyone to think of another climate solution that can do both mitigation, adaptation, and deliver all those co-benefits like recreation, flood alleviation, health and well-being, and so on as well. So nature-based solutions are absolutely brilliant, but they're no excuse for holding back on doing what needs to be done and stopping the bad stuff happening as well. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh, that's brilliant and has given us like I think all, between all three of you, there, there's huge meat for the conversation. So I think we can probably, it would be good to come to some specific examples, but before we do that, I think it'd be really good if I could go to both Owen and Melissa, just to kind of respond to the challenge, I think, that, that Craig put in the room in terms of like this uh, clear need to have this very kind of strong thinking about how you bring climate and nature together and how you do the decision making about it in a way that delivers the, the environmental integrity, the, the ongoing benefits that Craig talked about um, and, and makes that happen. Uh, maybe if I could start with Melissa and just sort of say, you know, you, you've, you've obviously been involved in this um, in, in previous and, and hopefully will be advising more companies as you kind of go forward. What, what do you see as sort of some of the, the opportunities and challenges of having to kind of make that conversation happen? And having to have decision makers grapple with this. Yeah, well, well, I completely agree with Craig Ben about the the kind of fear of nature based solutions being seen as this silver bullet, and that was partly of, of what I was saying around the controversy of the term in itself. You know, Unilever, my my most recent example, focuses on deep decarbonisation. You know, we, we uh, the company doesn't uh, seek to reach its emissions reductions through carbon offsets. So therefore, again, which is why na uh, nature based solutions is controversial. But I, um, I, I think you know that there are many kind of uh, in, in terms of bringing the nature and uh, climate crisis together. There are many company actions such as uh, uh, forest restoration, regenerative agriculture, which have metrics which look at carbon, which look at biodiversity, which look at soil. So I I do see from a corporate perspective this is coming together, and a lot of this work is coming together through the great work that the coalitions are doing, such as WBCSD and One Planet Business for biodiversity, they they divide out their work streams to look at things like the Science Based Targets Initiative for Climate and the Science Based Targets Network for Nature. And, and they look at kind of company feedback on two emerging methodologies and they kind of look at where the similarities are as well. So I think for, for, in my experience, the work that's happened um, with the coalitions for the last 10 years it has really come on you know they're they're really helping companies now it used to be 10 years ago we'd be involved in a press release at a big event and great uh, that that was the work through the coalitions but now they're really looking at the detail of this and and doing a lot of the heavy lifting and and looking at those synergies and 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 where we can kind of um bring this work together um 
Thanks, Melissa. Owen, maybe you could sort of also reflect on how easy it is for companies to balance all these different kind of challenges and benefits, and, and maybe if you could particularly take that down if you if, if you can, not just kind of the general decision making case, but into some specific examples. You talked very clearly about palm oil, coffee, and cocoa earlier, but you might have mm -hmm. some more. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, so I think first of all, I'd say we're we're in almost a bit of a privileged position in the food and, and beverage industry, um, whereby our supply chains are very clearly natural resources. You know, it's it's land, and and the way that we manage that land is is something that can be um, addressed relatively quickly in terms of the approach, the strategy, and and the objectives and targets, etc. And then the the transformation itself will will take, of course, time, and it will re rely very much on the local context. Um, which is why we have teams working all around the world with, with farmers and landowners and and um, communities as well to sort of understand specific needs in specific places. So we don't invest in the wrong project in the wrong place. You know that that's really important to to avoid. Mm -hmm. On the reductions and removals um, uh, discussion, there I think uh, again it's sort of like it's quite an integrated approach for food and beverage com companies because. We can uh, reduce emissions through our operations and through switching to more regenerative forms of agriculture. Um, but there's also this big opportunity to remove carbon through uh, nature-based solutions, which are almost kind of part of the same plan. Um, and I think that's that's preferable because it allows a greater level of oversight, um, longevity in terms of the approach. And also I think the realization of co-benefits, which which factor in quite a lot of economic perspectives as well. So, um, you know, you can you can safeguard a landscape, but if the uh, the community there, there's a negative economic impact from that action, it's unlikely to be successful and it's unlikely to last for the long term. Um, so I think diving into a bit more detail on what that means for, for us, you know, we, we've been involved in uh, efforts in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana on uh, preserving forests, uh, the remaining forests that are, that are left in those countries, um, which have come under quite a lot of pressure from cocoa cultivation. Uh, and a lot of the people cultivating cocoa are smallholders, um, people who are very much kind of um, on the lower end of the income spectrum um, and uh, are affected by poverty. And um, the approach taken there really is to try to understand the needs of the community as well as understand the the ecological impact of, of, of those activities um, and to devise solutions in partnership with local government and other partners which um, don't result in those negative social outcomes you know they actually address that first and foremost uh, and one thing we did was launch an income accelerator program where cocoa farmers are rewarded for carrying out certain practices uh, and some of those practices are around improving their efficiency so there's less pressure on land to expand some of those practices are around addressing some of the social issues that are occurring locally and the whole idea being to improve their economic model and to reduce pressure on uh, surrounding areas and in those surrounding areas we can also then fund uh, restoration projects which uh, are likely to last for the long term because of that kind of holistic integrated approach across um, both the economic and the ecological spheres so i think you know that's just one example but um really i think our approach is to try and take that into different contexts you know based on local considerations whether that's a a coffee farmer in Vietnam who is looking to improve their income through growing something else alongside their coffee plants on the same area of land, or it's a cocoa farmer in in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire who needs to um, have a more secure economic model uh, um, to avoid some of those risks of deforestation. So really kind of looking at it as an integrated reductions and removals approach and an integrated social and environmental approach as well. Melissa, it'd be interesting to hear if your experience echoes Owen's and I think, you know, some, some really strong themes there about firstly about kind of what you're managing, secondly about the importance of place and locality, and thirdly about like the local stakeholder engagement. So just interested in your thoughts on, 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 any, on any of those themes and, and your exp experience and anything that's a little bit different to that. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it is similar because the, these are big, huge um complicated supply chains. I think some of the work that I've been um, encouraged about is the work around the palm oil supply chain. So the kind of the evolution into production landscapes uh, that Unilever has. So, um, and, and the people part is so important, you know, before you can go into these landscapes and even kind of train the farmers, measure the nature, etc. you have to aggregate the farmers, you have to make sure that they've got the, 
the right lamb rights you have to kind of make sure they're even aggregated into these groups to be able to train them and 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 the people part is so critical Unilever's got um it, it's kind of supply chain policy for this which is called the people and nature policy and all of the people work um comes first and um the, the idea of these landscapes is that you can kind of increase the production of palm oil without converting any extra land and you you um protect the surrounding areas so a riparian reserve a wildlife corridor and then you go in with partners and, and partners is key because the partners are NGOs such as WWF or the subnational governments and you you go in and you measure this and you invest for the long term um, and 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 you know that and I, I very much see other companies uh, taking this type of approach and, and scaling up uh, this type of work. I mean, Craig, Melissa just talked about the importance of partnership. I don't know if there's something from, from your perspective as an NGO or heading up an NGO, how, how you would see that and what some of the things that you would be asking companies to bear in mind when they're deciding whether to do these projects or what would what would make the success or failure in these projects. I think partnership is absolutely crucial uh, in this, uh, both for companies and both for NGOs and community groups to be able to deliver on any of this because it does need that kind of you, that special blend of people coming from different perspectives and bringing different things to the party to kind of make it happen. It's important, I think, for everyone to understand, you know, what's what's crucial in all of that. Uh, every party in that, whether you're a company or whether you're an NGO community group, will, will, will want to make sure that they can defend, if you like, their partnership with others in the face of their own um, uh, of their own sort of um, groupings really and their own supporters and so from you know our point of view say as the wildlife trusts we are very enthusiastic about working with companies on the rollout of nature-based solutions um, but in doing that we want to we'll, we'll only do that with companies that we feel confident are doing everything they can to in the case of carbon stop burning fossil fuels at source and, and then we can have a conversations about what to do with the residual emissions if we're really really sure that the company's done everything it can investing in new technology for energy efficiency and transitioning out of fossil fuels then we can we're clear to have a really good conversation about what to do with that residual emissions or even historic emissions and so on but we don't we don't want to be accused by our supporters or by other stakeholders of of facilitating business to carry on with business as usual uh, so it's kind of really important that we're working with the companies that can do that. But when we do get that kind of agreement, where we do think that we can see eye to eye and a, and a, and a company and sort of look at, shares a agenda and a perspective on, say, nature-based solutions similar to ours, then we're really excited about what can be delivered. And just in January, we announced a huge partnership, a 100-year partnership with Aviva Insurance, which sees them investing £38 million uh, in the Wildlife Trust helping to restore uh, temperate rainforest to the UK, to the west coast of the UK, and that's perhaps one of the biggest corporate partnerships in history of the UK really, um, and we're hugely excited about that. That will result in a, uh, in a habitat which is only tiny fragmented parts of it left at the moment, uh, restoring that up the west coast of the UK, and uh, it's only through a partnership like that we can dare to dream that we can do such a thing. So there's an awful lot of potential here, but all the parties need to understand um, what's the sort of rules of the game, if you'd like, to be able to enable that partnership to happen. Do you think business needs to, in order to, to make some of these projects happen? I mean, Owen talked about, you know, planting the right trees in the right place and understanding that. Do you think business needs to uh, be able to invest in just greater environmental understanding to, to understand these landscapes and these localities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so worth saying, you know, I, of course, uh, I, I support, I, I like trees, I want to see trees, right trees planted in the right place and so on. But I think there's been a bit too much of a focus just on trees over the last few years. I said, I hinted at before, what I was saying before is we, uh, I, I kind of get a bit exhausted, the number of people think the answer to everything is planting trees. That's not to say we shouldn't plant trees, there's some real benefits in that. But, um, Surely what we're about is trying to create forest habitat uh, with all the benefits that come from that rather than create a crop uh, which is actually just no more than an oversized grown wheat field essentially. You know this is not about a new form of agriculture, it's about nature and therefore trying to create a forest ecosystem with all the sort of undergrowth and the 
soil communities, the soil carbon and the fungal networks that go with that and so on, uh, takes a bit longer, but the prize you get at the, at the end is so much bigger. And obviously you also want to do it absolutely with cooperation and involvement of local communities so that community, local communities, whether we're talking in the global north or particularly in the global south, this feels like this is something done with and for local communities and empowering local communities to be part of this rather than something that is done to local communities and then that won't last and endure and it will be seen as a, as a, a you know, again, big business or even big NGOs trying to force their agenda on others. So yes, a lot of this is complicated. A lot of that means that you need uh, business and NGOs to make sure they fully understand all the different dimensions of this before engaging in it and understand all these kind of different perspectives. It's about constantly learning and not thinking there's ever a moment when you know it all and recognizing that it's like lifelong learning that's required around all of these. But my goodness, the prize when you can get it right is phenomenal. If I flip this to, to the other two, because I think there is something really interesting here, which is that the specificity, the engagement, the upfront investment needed to unlock value in these projects. Obviously, to a certain extent, there's a tension between some of the, the things that are often business decision making is looking for efficiency, scale, you know, replicability that you can you can do some of this stuff. How how easy is it? Have you found it to make the case for these kind of projects within within a business structure? Maybe if I could start with you, Melissa, is that OK? Um, yeah, well, I, I, you know, it, Unilever has a long history of doing this, particularly in the palm oil supply chain. Um, in terms of kind of making the case, uh, it, it's very much kind of linked to the broad ambitions. There used to be a separate sustainability target and a, a, a kind of global business target, and now they're the same thing. So there, there's not much kind of need for making the case. It's integral to the business strategy. But I, th I think it kind of a key piece to this as well as the kind of the skills within a business to be able to do it and um the the kind of the need to upskill people and hire the right people in the future and i think that that is um a, a real gap at the moment just generally people understanding this enough in terms of kind of what a business needs and the technicalities of what's needed through sbti and sbtn and how do you navigate this huge sea of coalitions and partners and supply chains and I think um, a, a big increase over the next few years is kind of built uh, filling that skills gap you know um, making sure enough people understand about this and are trained in the right way um, and, and I think that that's a big gap at the moment. So I've been sort of same question to you about you know how, how you make the case internally but I'm, then I'm also interested to build off of Melissa's point Melissa's talked about the things you need to build internally in terms of the skills the, the ability to navigate this landscape we've talked about the partnership also interested to think to hear from you in terms of other things that need to shift in the landscape to enable progress yeah sure so i think you know as i mentioned before we kind of went from a um, no deforestation approach through to a forest preservation approach and now into more of what we call the forest positive approach and so over time, I think the case has made itself, you know, based on the progress that we've made uh, in improving traceability and in using some of these innovative tools that I mentioned before about monitoring progress. Um, making the case is, is, is more straightforward when it's connected to a big objective like the net zero plan that we have um, and the fact that we are not focused on the offsets market, but focused on uh, projects within our value chains. And I think that's um, slightly easier to uh, to make the case for because it forms a part of our relationships with our suppliers as well. I mean, quite often those are long-term relationships. They're obviously they're commercial relationships. And so if we can introduce another element into those relationships of um, safeguarding natural resources and then looking for, you know, those win-wins uh, on, restoring landscapes uh, which benefit the supplier and benefit the end user which is Nestle in this instance and of course our customers right so you know we're, we're purchasing we're often in the middle so we we purchase uh, what we call raw materials you know food ingredients um, from suppliers uh, we manufacture those into products we sell them to customers which are often retailers and then they sell them to consumers uh, who are the general public buying products on a day-to-day -day basis so all of these parts of the chain have a role to play uh, and I think the supplier side is really, really important for the projects, make sure the projects happen in the right places, that they are monitored for the long term, that they have a sound financial basis. Uh, I think the our role is really to set ourselves tough 
targets and commitments and to listen carefully to the outside world and adjust our strategy as a, a, according to how things evolve. And they certainly are evolving quickly. You know, this understanding of the integrated nature, integrated nature of nature and climate, um, of the role of water resources within that, and obviously communities, as I mentioned before, is, is evolving rapidly in, in, in a good direction. And then we need to sort of fit that into how we deal with our customers. You know, there's, a, there's obviously a commercial element there too, you know, um, and um, if our actions meet our customers' requirements, that's a good thing for Nestle, right? And then of course, if we're meeting consumer demand and consumer expectations, then that makes the business case even stronger. So, you know, really, I think it's about linking it to um, doing the right thing, uh, you know, having strong uh, commitments, which meet societal expectations, but also to frame it within a, a business, a set of business relationships that are, that are already there. I'm going to start introducing questions from the audience because we've had we've had a bundle and there's some very good ones. Um, and it's it's a difficult question for, for all of us because we've got two, we've got a representative of food and consumer goods company and then a former representative of food and consumer goods company and NGO. The question is basically, is this just an issue that um, certain sectors engage with, um, you know, that there are some very exposed sectors, you know, sub commodity consumer goods companies, mining, you know, um, potentially water utilities, they're very exposed to these things, um, but that other companies just treat as a as a side issue. And if you think that is the case, how do, how do we um, how do we convince business more broadly beyond sort of these key sectors like agriculture and mining with a very strong land footprint about the value of biodiversity as a strategic concern? It's not just a, a nice to have, but it's a strategic interest. Um, I'm going to start opening. So do try and catch my eye virtually if you want to say this, but maybe I will uh, start with Craig because I know he's never knowingly lost for things to say. Thank you. Um, well, particularly on this topic, um, uh, look, I mean, the first thing I would say, this is something that society needs to get its head around. Never mind, you know, just one business sector or another. The whole of society needs to understand and learn, and our politics, our economy, we need to learn and celebrate just how essential nature-based solutions are for human progress. You know, uh, we're not going to progress very much as humanity unless we learn to live fairly within environmental limits and actually to reconnect, but restore nature and restore the connection between people and nature in the process of that. And, you know, to think more widely, I mean, uh, I know we will have people joining us from around the world here, but um, in the UK at the moment, uh, well, it's pretty much always been the case, but there's been a, there's a big debate at the moment about the crisis in our, na in our National Health Service. And our National Health Service is really under strain in the UK at the moment as well, our publicly funded health service of which we're very proud and which turns 70 years old this summer. I mean, I would say there will always be a crisis in the NHS in the UK for as long as nature's in decline. There will always be a crisis until we can actually start to restore nature because there's a very, very clear role. There's a very clear nature-based solutions to a lot of health problems, uh, which is nature, nature on our doorstep. My goodness, we learned during the lockdowns of COVID just how important a daily dose of nature was for people's health and well-being. There is very clear scientific evidence of the role that nature can play in and around our towns or cities of improving air quality, for example, or indeed even water quality, and actually shifting from a concept of, of not so much a natural uh, a national health service to a national wellness service will actually be a much more sustainable and effective approach longer term but for that we need to see that there's an extraordinary role that nature can play in trying to keep society healthy so even on a topic like that we need to think this is not just a issue for you know uh, business alone uh, or indeed uh, a particular sector of business or some parts of it everyone needs to be playing their part in looking at how we can try and make sure that nature is there to provide these huge benefits these nature-based solutions as well as obviously stopping all the bad stuff everything i said before goes the same as well before and then we can start to live uh, life more sustainably on this planet so it's it's really wrapped up into that wider system change debate that i think is so important Melissa, owen talked about the kind of the various components of, of building the business case and, and craig talked about the need to sort of shift policy You've talked about things like the global biodiversity framework and the the big sort of the growth of new coalitions, new partnerships around this. I wondered if you had any thinking about um, 
you know the the balance between where business can can be trusted or a, a allowed to act and where we need to see kind of stronger policy frameworks uh, enabling and, and driving action and what you think business should be doing in terms of engaging in those policy conversations yeah so um I, I mean my head was also in the kind of the question that came through the panel so just to kind of start with that and then what businesses can do i think you know that there's so many the ng the activist ngos are doing such a great job at the moment that, that it almost feels like that you know if, if a company wasn't doing whatever there's no room to hide and um the coalitions are doing a great job in terms of kind of proving the economic case for investing in nature with with real life examples and 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 the coalitions as i said before are, are, are seem to me but more helpful than they ever have in the last 10 years so and, and in terms of what business can actually do, um, I think if you're operating at a global scale, you need kind of good internal policies for what is a quality nature-based solution, what's a quality uh, nature intervention. So Unilever has got its Sustainable Agriculture Code and its Regenerative Agriculture Principles, which it implements with farmers at scale, and, and, and the, they're kind of created in development with lots of different partners and NGOs. And um, I spoke before about kind of the focus on people so like looking at where your material impact is aggregating kind of local people there and 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 uh, for, uh kind of connecting those relationships so you know what matters on the ground in a particular area um upscaling your own people um and again i think this is where coalitions can be so helpful um and i will go back to the kind of the example of spti and sptn but um some of the coalitions are looking at kind of these emerging methodologies and what actually works in a very complicated supply chain where raw materials are brought in directly and you know you you kind of have a supply shared approach where you don't you go into a landscape you don't have kind of direct sight at the moment of where that comes from so you have to look at the wider landscapes and what the implications are there and the coalitions are doing a good job at, at kind of making these methodologies make sense for businesses so there's many opportunities for businesses to go in have those initial conversations and and work out where they can start and and you, and again the the kind of the importance of assessing your material impact means that you don't have to start big you know you can kind of look at where it, your material focus is for your business and you can go in and get that help in that particular area there's there's so much advice available Thanks, Melissa. Maybe, um, and I think that's exactly right. By the way, I think as we, you know, more and more questions entering into the mix. So as as I kind of go go around, you all feel free to pick up threads that I haven't directly asked you about, and, and keep on keep the conversation going. Owen, maybe if I could move to you and, and just you know your own perspective on on some of these things, but also I think we're getting a thread of questions around how do you under, how do you assure the quality? Like you've talked about the technologies, how, what, what technologies are important. Melissa's talked about kind of like the, the coalitions and the accounting frameworks, or like what, what accounting frameworks is natural capital accounting used for? Um, you know, what are the things that we need to do to um, ensure that when we're doing a nature-based solution project or something that loosely falls into that camp, it's a good one, it's worth doing? Mm. Yeah, so maybe just to, to answer the first question initially, um, I think that it's right that all companies should look at how they can contribute. You know, nature is a, is a shared resource. It's all, it's, it's, it's everything really. Um, and there will be an entry point, you know, for almost any organization into, into, into their impact on nature and that, that can be assessed and addressed in some way. It may be very minimal, it may, it may be very existential. Um, I think having said that, food and land use companies do have a particular role to play because, slightly differently to the climate crisis the biodiversity crisis is is strongly influenced by agriculture you know because that's where the land use element comes in and so for us not to address that as big food or or land use uh, companies it, it is we're not going to get anywhere you know we're not going to solve the problem if um i think large food and beverage companies don't do something about it um it, you know similarly to on, on on the climate crisis we need to have all sectors pulling hard but really the energy system is is, is crucial um at least initially making progress so you know i think i think there is a special role um for, for food and beverage companies um and then in terms of like you know ensuring you get it right well 
first thing to say is that we definitely don't have a perfect solution right now. We we are learning as we go. Um, you know, what looked correct in 2020 when we launched our net zero roadmap is rapidly looking out of date. And we need to sort of think about that. And, and, and that's where the stakeholder engagement comes in. That's where the community engagement comes in to figure out what's working, what isn't working, and how to tailor and and focus your strategy going forwards. And I think the things that are successful involve partners in it for the long term. So that could be, for example, we're working on something called the Rimba Collective in uh, palm oil sourcing regions. So I think Unilever might be a member of that one as well. Yep. Um, and that's around using a third party financing partner who's supporting collective actions, which then the individual companies can benefit from by being by being part of that, that collective arrangement. And, you know, the sums of money involved are very significant and the, the timeframes are, uh, are out to the 25, 30 year period. You know, so that kind of long term approach, I think, is a good way of ensuring progress because there's there's a level of buy in, which means you don't you know, you, you need to evolve it over time, make it work uh, and, and figure out um, which partners to, to really go in with. Um, and then in terms of figuring out, figuring out what works, it's again, just coming back to this point on local networks, people with local knowledge, whether that's inside the company or outside the company, it's absolutely critical. Uh, and we have, at Nestle, we have a, a, a network, for example, of 2000 agronomists who are based in many different countries. Most of those are in the global south. They uh, have very strong connections with local people um, and farmers in particular, and they can really understand where where the challenges are and where maybe the solutions should be targeted. So we're not deciding things from here in Switzerland that um, take place in um, you know rural areas of West Africa or Brazil. We're, we're 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 doing those decisions much more on a local basis based on that local knowledge. So I think um, longevity, the right partners, and and local understanding are key factors. Okay, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go round and ask you for your kind of like final thoughts each of the panel. But as I do that, I think we've we've talked a lot about um, what makes success, what you need to consider, all of those kind of questions. Um, and we've talked, I think, a little bit about where nature-based solutions aren't appropriate and the limits to them. But if we if we take all of that as read and and, and take the point of view that nature-based solutions are a valuable piece of the puzzle and we need them to grow and to be bigger. Than they currently are um, so one of the kind of questions that comes through is what do we need to do from from the audience is what do we need to do to scale nature-based solutions so if i can kind of collectively ask you as you go around you know think what's your one or two things you want to leave the audience as a takeaway but particularly to respond to this question like what do we need to do to really scale this to get it to, to deliver on its potential and is that about, and the, the particular example of, is it something to do with, should they be on the agenda at COP28 or do we need a further international thing? But there might be other kind of practical no, questions. No. Oh, might have lost one of our speakers. So I'm going to start with Craig, if you like, and Craig. then go past Owen and yeah. Melissa, if we've got it. Thanks, Elliot. Um, well, I think one of, the, one of the things that's really important to take these to scale is to build the kind of trust and confidence of all players in the huge role that they can play. So, you know, to echo something that Owen was saying there, you know, I think it is, it's really important that companies engage in this, do this with the right partners, uh, the, or the other organisations, be they profit or not for profit, or community based that can can absolutely have the lot you know have the long term skills and knowledge about how to do this and can see the big picture and that what's particularly important in that are two things is one that actually we look at the these issues holistically in terms of the problems they can solve so not just look say through a, a narrow carbon lens but look at all those kind of wider co benefits actually how employing a nature based solution yeah can be good on the carbon debate but also good on the nature debate, on the soil debate, on the flood alleviation debate and, and, and so on. Um, but crucially also, as Owen was saying, that there's the local, they have links to local partners and lo in particular local communities as well to make sure that there's the community buy-in and support for whatever's going to be taken to scale. And obviously there's a big role for standards in this as well. But I mean, uh, and there's various standards out there for uh, how to undertake these uh, nature-based solutions, IUCN, well, Conservation Union has a nature-based solution standard. Of course, there's different standards for uh, different carbon tools as well. And that's very important. But but ultimately, it's about trying to look at these through a much more uh, holistic lens, look at it from a system change point of view, 
rather than thinking that they can help in a very narrow siloed way to deliver on one particular part of the corporate sustainability strategy actually it should be there for the for the much wider bigger story um, but for companies that really want to get serious want to be be absolute serious players on sustainability and to be recognized for the leadership role in 5 10 15 years time uh, nature based solutions i think have to be absolutely crucially a big part of the solution Thank you, Craig. Um, unfortunately, we've lost Melissa to a fire alarm, um, so we, we're, a, we're a panelist down, but these things happen. Uh, Owen, over to you. You know your, your thoughts that you want to leave people with, but also this question about how to get to scale. Yeah, thanks. I think um, you know in terms of getting to scale, there is a need to build confidence between um, different partners uh, and. Um, you know, again, I'm coming from a fairly um, privileged position in terms of Nestle because we've been working for over a decade on, you know, managing our impact on on nature, on on forests, so arguably much longer than that. Um, and so we've we've learned quite a lot a lot along the way. Um, but there are going to still be instances of um, negative reactions to what we're doing, um, and and it's important to kind of lean into those discussions and listen and to learn and to figure out how you can. You know even do even better you know by by understanding if it's a community that feels that we're doing um that we could improve our approach or if it's a stakeholder who thinks that our um our strategy might need um a, a bit of tweaking or improvement then it's important to kind of listen and learn along the way and, and not to sort of go out there and say we've got this wonderful solution it's called planting trees and uh, that's going to solve all of the uh, issues that we've got you know we, we're certainly conscious not to do that and, and i think that goes for everybody else too at the same time, to not let the, any sort of pushback derail the intention and the ambition, you know, and to keep the ambition level high by working out what works in, in which location. And um, I mentioned a few examples today, you know, palm oil is an obvious one where rates of deforestation have significantly reduced in the palm oil sourcing regions of Indonesia and Malaysia through collective efforts over a long time, um, involving companies, suppliers, governments and NGOs as well. And that was a pretty adversarial kind of type of relationship to begin with. I think over time, you know, the, the sense of partnership has built, um, whether it's with our company or with other companies sourcing from those regions. And the end result is positive, you know, in terms of reducing those negative impacts and then moving into a, a restorative phase. So I think, you know, be in, be in it for the long term, don't let short term pressures push you off course, um, but at the same time, listen and learn. That would be my conclusion. Thanks. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Craig. And thank you, Melissa, in her absence. Um, I found that that fascinating. Um, also, thank you to everybody who's joined us either in directly in the webinar or on the live stream. I also have an apology for those of you who uh, tried to join the live stream early. So I understand there were some uh, early teething issues in terms of setting things up. So you may have missed the very start. Do not worry. If you keep an eye on CISL's Nature Positive Hub on our website, you will find the recording of this streaming. Um, so you can catch up on, on the early sections of this that you've missed. Uh, I just thank you. So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for your engagement, but also thank you for the excellent questions that supplied. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get to all of them, but I think we managed to uh, engage with quite a few. I found that a fascinating and useful discussion. I think that um, I really appreciated the, the breadth and, and different levels of engagement. But I'm just going to pick up on maybe the very last thing that Owen said, because I thought that was you know, a really important note to finish on. Um, you know, uh, the example from, from Indonesia of, of actual practical impacts of rates of deforestation falling, that's, that's what we want to see. That's exactly so brilliant to hear that when this is done right, it can, it can shift things, it can achieve those kind of impacts that we're all working towards. Obviously really important that we then kind of think about how to expand and accelerate that and, and link it to other efforts so that we don't just reduce the rates of deforestation, but we turn that into ending and in fact restoring kind of levels of forestry so that we're able, we get some of the, the benefits both economic social climate climate impact climate mitigation that, that craig has talked about so eloquently but without too much further ado we are um at time so i'm going to again say thank you to everyone who's involved and look forward to hearing from you and speaking to you at future events thank you very much <laughs>